I just want to read, if I may, I don't normally read to you, I want to read some statistics which illuminate something very important in the media landscape. As I said earlier, twice as many people were waiting for us to come on air than were watching Rupert Murdoch's talk TV. Episode 154, last Sunday's episode, was a slightly disappointing audience. It was 913,000 people. Piers Morgan had 67,000, and his colleagues on Talk TV were oftentimes talking to 5,000 people or fewer. Episode 154 was 913,000. The YouTube stream alone was three times what it was in January. YouTube clips were viewed by 265,000 people. Facebook clips by 301,000 people. And TikTok, our biggest growth area of them all, I wish they would sponsor the show. Come on, TikTok, how about it? TikTok, which we've only been on for a few weeks, had 180,000 viewers. Two clips alone, uh, the uh, May Day holiday to you, that was, I think, my introduction, was viewed by 77.2 thousand people. And my bit about one in three British fish and chip shops having to close was viewed by 52 thousand people. The Facebook monologue was viewed by 93 thousand people. I could go on and on. But here's my point. Talk TV has a promotional budget of millions of pounds. It was years in the making. It hired, I've no doubt, at a salary in the millions, Piers Morgan as its front man. And it has completely flopped. It has completely flopped like all of the sofa politics television in Britain. Far too many of them singing exactly the same song, interviewing exactly the same people taking exactly the same line on every matter from domestic to international. And there's a lesson there. The reason that our numbers are exponentially larger than a multi-million pound operation run out of Rupert Murdoch Towers at London Bridge is because we are different, because we are free. We are not just free to air, and I'll come to that later, but we are free to speak our minds. Nobody tells us what to think or what to say. That goes for me, it goes for my far more interesting guests, most of which would never be invited onto Piers Morgan's show, but who are far more interesting than the people who are invited onto his show and others. I don't dislike Piers Morgan, by the way, I just think that the contrast between our show and his is particularly stark and illuminating. But it also goes for you. You can call this show, I have no idea who you are, and I have no idea what you're going to say, what you're going to ask me. None of that would ever be attempted anywhere else in the British television business, in the world television business, because everything I've just said goes throughout what we'll call the Anglosphere. Amongst English-speaking people around the world, this show is completely unique, but it's an endangered species. And I've got to tell you, we are falling dangerously short in the audience support that you have been giving. Some people have been incredibly kind and generous giving far more than we asked for and that I'm asking for now. A man stopped me in London today. His name was Jim Bergen. He stopped me in London and gave me 40 pounds in cash. I've still got it in my uh, ticket pocket somewhere. 40 pounds in cash he gave me for your show because he said, I watch every week, there it is, 220. No, a 20 and two tenths. That's what he gave me 
today, which was all the folding money that he had. And he explained he doesn't understand PayPal and websites and he's only got a basic phone and so on. That's the kind of generosity that we are meeting. So if you are, and you know who you are, amongst those who've given really generously over the few weeks that I've been asking you to give, and it has only been a few weeks, then please take a holiday. Don't keep giving. Because I'm after that big audience, and I'm asking you only for one dollar. One dollar. Am I not worth one dollar? Is this show not worth one dollar? There's no adverts like there is on other television stations. You don't have to buy a license fee and get sent to jail if you don't to watch the mother of all talk shows. I'm asking for one dollar or one pound if you are in Britain or one euro if you are in Ireland or elsewhere in the European Union. I'm not going to keep saying it, but we're falling dangerously short. It goes without saying that I'm being paid no wages at all. Zero. I'm doing this for zero. Piers Morgan is doing it for millions. But I've got to pay everybody else. And I've got to pay for this studio. And the one, two, three, four cameras. And the sound. And the people on the telephones. You get me? That's the last I'm going to say about it. Now, the United States spent 2.3 trillion pounds, that's T trillion pounds, on the war in Afghanistan. When they scuttled out like thieves in the night, leaving their allies in the lurch in Afghanistan, bringing back to power the very people that the whole 20-year Afghan war had been about crushing and defeating and driving out of power and keeping them out of power, they left behind $80 billion worth of material, of military hardware, oftentimes of the most sophisticated and oftentimes brand new models. $80 billion. Why do I mention it? Well, partly because the Taliban are in the news this morning because they have tightened their hideous diktat to the women of Afghanistan about what clothes they have to wear. It goes without saying, I deplore that. But even more than deploring that, I deplore the fact that having occupied them for 20 whole years, the longest war in America's history, in Britain's history, well, not in Britain's history, we fought a year war against the French and may do so again <laughs> but it's America's longest war. Having occupied them for 20 years, having killed untold tens scores of thousands of them, maybe hundreds of thousands of them over that 20 years and having run out on them despite all the promises that we made the Afghan people are currently starving and the liberal airwaves and newsprint columns are filled with anguished people talking about the clothes that Afghan women now have to wear. What about the fact that the Afghan women are starving, whatever they're wearing or not wearing? That their children are starving? That the whole country is in a state of mass starvation? Don't we have some obligations in that? You'll see where I'm going with this in just one minute. But not only have we deserted them, left most of the country starving, was wringing our hands about burqas, we have stolen $7 billion of their money that they entrusted into American banks. We've stolen it and we've given half of it to the victims of 9-11. But no Afghan was involved in 9-11. No single Afghan had anything remotely to do with 
It was Saudis that did that crime. And as we now discover, with Saudi government involvement in released papers this very week, it's revealed that the Saudi government was up to its neck in the crime of 9-11. Why aren't you seizing their money instead of the poor, hungry, benighted Afghans? Now, I mention all these numbers because Joe Biden has just announced that he's going to give $33 billion to the Ukraine for more and more and more weapons, much of which is de destroyed before it even gets to the battlefield, much of which is stolen and sold, including to the Russian invaders. Others of it is ending up on the dark web. Others of it doesn't work at all, including, rather embarrassingly, uh, the 200,000 pound British made missiles that didn't explode and were filmed by the people amongst whom they fell this very day, if you look for it on social media. 33 billion in a country, the United States, which is falling apart at the seams, whose students have a trillion dollar student debt that they cannot pay, whose workers are on a pathetic minimum wage, utterly pathetic minimum wage, much worse than the British minimum wage, and who are increasingly unemployed, underpaid, facing rocketing inflation, prices that they literally cannot pay, not can only pay with a grump, a growl, more about growls in a minute, but they cannot pay because of American sanctions on Russia. That great stone that the Western governments in the European Union, Britain, and the United States have struggled mightily to lift, only to drop on their own feet. This America that couldn't pass a stimulus budget Remember, the stimulus budget that never passed is going to spend $33 billion on more military hardware for a war that cannot be won and is even right now, this day, being lost, comprehensively lost. So I'm asking tonight, not my usual question, would you send Joe Biden out for a loaf? Because I wouldn't. I wouldn't expect him to come back with the right loaf or the right change or even to come back at all. But he's the president of the United States that is spending money like a drunken sailor, not on its own people, but on military equipment and material to pour into the ravenous jaws of war, the proxy war that they now openly admit is a proxy war between the United States and Russia. I don't even think he'll complete his presidential term. There's a poll up there. Now, will Joe Biden complete his U.S. presidential term? A yes. B, no. You can vote on my Twitter feed, on my YouTube channel. Please subscribe. I'm dangerously close to 200,000 subscribers. I want to get there quick because they didn't give me a plaque for my first 100,000. I'm hoping they can't refuse me on my second. You can also vote on my Telegram channel, t.me forward slash George Galloway. Lastly, if the director will permit me overrunning my time by a minute or two. You need a heart of stone not to laugh at the plight that the Labour leader in Britain, Sir Keir Starmer, a big stumer, a big plank of wood. You need a heart of stone not to laugh at the plight 
he finds himself in this Sunday. Having made Boris Johnson eating a birthday cake in the cabinet office during his working day on his birthday, having made that the number one issue in British politics, having gone nuclear with Partygate, demanding the Prime Minister's resignation because he was under investigation for breaches of the COVID lockdown rules, Keir Starmer has been caught red-handed doing exactly the same thing. In fact, worse than the same thing. Because the Mail on Sunday today has published a document written in advance, therefore premeditated, giving a program for Keir Starmer in Durham, in the northeast of England, in which it's clearly stated that we'll leave our hotel where food was on offer and we'll take a walk together down to the miners' hall. What did the miners do to deserve that? And then we'll have a meeting, a meeting which was not permitted under the lockdown rules that Starmer was demanding should be more and more onerous, outgunning the Prime Minister. Every time he announced new restrictions, Starmer demanded more restrictions, earlier and more. And then it says, printed on the document, we've ordered a takeaway curry. Does everyone know what curry is around the world? I'm sure they do. And even gave the name of the restaurant from which they were buying it and then we'll all have alcohol and curry around the table all of it in absolutely flagrant breach of the laws that Starmer was not just defending but was demanding should be toughened up lastly on the subject of who deserves what do the Ukrainians on top of all the other misery and suffering of a war in their country, really deserve Bono in their underground station, foolishly called a bomb shelter, but in fact the metro built by the Soviet Union when Ukraine was a member, they've got Bono. He still hasn't found what he's looking for, you see. I hope you have been looking for a show like this.